Hello, everyone. Today, we are starting a new series called Fundamentals of Investments. And the first part in this series is to begin with basic stock return calculations. So I will be covering a few fundamental concepts in this uh, tutorial, starting with gross. Oops, this is too high. Let's <clears throat> clear this. Gross versus net returns, okay? Let's think in very simple terms. So let's say you buy a stock today, hold it for a period, can be a year, can be a day, can be a month, and then sell it, okay? So let's try to compute our return. So let's assume we paid $100 for the stock, and this, can, this is true for any asset in general, not just for stocks. And let's say we sold it for 110. So clearly we made a profit of $10. But how about our return? So let's begin with the gross return. Gross return is simply the selling price over the purchase price. So basically gross return would be 110 over 100 is equal to oops 110 percent okay but of course often we are more interested in our net return because we paid 100 right and you know we still have the 100 here on top of that we earned this 10 dollars so you know it, gross return is fine but how about our net return well the calculation is still very simple and very similar, we begin with the gross return, but then simply subtract one. And this would give you, oops, why is this a bit not helping me? Right here, 10%. Okay, so this is our net return. This is our gross return. So let me also give you some general formulas. So if you buy an asset for a stock for PT, right? And later on, you sell it for PT plus one, gross return is PT plus one over PT. Okay, so this is the gross return. And if you subtract one, you get the net return. Okay, so this is our general formula for net return. And without the minus one, we've got the general formula for gross returns. Okay, this is great. So this is the most basic return calculation. Now, in the case of stocks, it's not just the selling price that matters, right? For many stocks, there are dividend payments. There are cash flows as well. So the next thing I would like to look at is the dividend yield and capital gains. So when we talk about a stock's return, there's a concept called total return. Okay, so let me clear here and go move on to our next topic or concept. So the total return on a stock has two components, dividend yield, right? Dividend investors are particularly interested in this, of course, plus capital gains. Now, some stocks won't pay any dividends, right? Especially growth stocks, they, these guys are, or the firms are, busy sort of keeping the retaining their earnings to invest in their projects so for them the dividend yield would simply be zero and they will focus on capital gains but once companies start to ma mature they do start typically paying dividends so then the stock would have two return components so let me illustrate this with an example again so let's say at time zero so this is our 
timeline. So we've got time zero, time one. Again, let's say you buy the stock for hundred dollars and we sell it for 110. So everything is the same as before, but let's assume on top of this uh, cash flow that we receive on that day, there was also a dividend payment of let's say $5, okay? Now, how am I gonna make the return calculations? This $5 is cash in my pocket. So I have to you know, consider that as part of my return, right? So what I need to do, for example, beginning with the gross return, I have my 110. So without the dividend, I would simply have 110 over 100 as before. But because I have a dividend payment, I, I need to add that here as well, okay? So in this case, my gross return would be 115%, okay? And it's not hard to see that my net return will be 15%, right? So this is gross. And if I subtract one, get the net return. Okay, this is great. So the total return, and let's think about total net return, is 15%. Now I would like to decompose it, uh, this into two parts to find the dividend yield and the capital gains. So how am I gonna do that? Essentially, I need to split this into two parts. So dividend yield will be based on this cash flow, right? So dividend yield, is the amount of dividend I receive over the purchase price. So it's 5%. And it's easy to see that if this is 5%, capital gains has to be 10% because the total return is 15%. But we can verify that because my selling price is 110, right? So 110 divided by 100, so this is the gross return, minus one, oops, equals 10%. Here we are. So we have decomposed the total stock return into two components. One is the dividend yield, and one is the capital gains, right? Okay, this is done as well now. And there is, let me clear everything here. There's one last important concept that I would like to cover in this video, which is called the holding period return. So far, we have focused on just a single period, right? So, you know, like a month, year, etc. But investors, when they buy stocks, they often hold them for multiple periods. You can think of this as many months or many years, many days, it doesn't really matter. So you buy at time zero, then you hold it, say, many months, okay? And in this case, let's assume that we um, buy it here, $400. And let's say we sell it, or simply let's assume we sell it over here, okay? Now, what I'm really interested in is my return over this entire period, right? This is the holding period return. And let's, let's suppose I sell it for 120, okay? So what will be my holding period return? You need to be a bit careful. If there are no other cash flows over here, Okay, so like dividends, for example. And if there are no stock splits, because the stock splits would change the uh, price just mechanically. So if you, for example, double the number of shares, the share price should halve. Okay. If there are no such things like dividends, share splits, etc., I can simply use the final price uh, uh, divided by the original price to calculate my holding period return. So in this case, the gross return will be 120% and the net return will be 20%.
but often there might be especially for long periods there might be additional cash flows or you know other actions like stock splits over the period right over the holding period uh, yeah, over the holding period so we have to be careful so the prudent thing to do is to basically calculate the return for each period and then to compound them to find the holding period return so for example let's suppose you know the price uh, goes down to 90 here okay and then let's say it goes back up to 100 here and let's suppose there is an additional uh, dividend of five pounds here so what i need to do now is really to compute the return for each period okay and to compound that so what do, I, what do I mean by compounding? So let's say these are uh, the um, net returns. Okay, R1, R2, and R3. So what I, to find the holding period return, so I've got the gross return for the first period times the gross return second period Oops. gross return for the third period this is fine this gives me the gross holding period return and if i subtract one i get the net holding period return okay so let's illustrate that so for for example for the first period the gro gross return is 90 over 100 okay if I had subtracted one, I would get um, the net return, which would be negative. It would be negative 10%, right? Minus 10%. Okay, so this is my first gross return. The second one is 105 divided by 90. Okay, why? Because I have 100 plus five, and the starting price in this period was 90. Okay. And finally, 120 divided by the starting price, which is 100. Okay, so I can actually make some and minus one, okay? Can make some simplification, so this, um, these things cancel out. So I need to basically divide, sorry, multiply, 105 uh, by 120. I'm just going to use my calculator to do that and divide by 10,000, right? And this will be 1.26. I hope I've done it right. And if I subtract one, I end up with 0.26, which is 26 percent so the holding period return the net return is 26 percent and as you can see if i ignore this stuff if i simply looked at the final price and original price i would make a mistake because then so if i set the final price 120 divided by 100 this would give me 20 percent this is lower why? Because this ignores the dividend earned uh, during this holding period, right? So that's uh, accounted for here. You might say, oh, why it's not 25%? It's not because basically you also reinvest this period, uh, $5. It's assumed that you reinvested over this period, okay? So we've got 26% return as a result of that. Okay, so I think that's all uh, I want to cover in this uh, first video on um, fundamentals of investments. So I will see you at the next video. Thank you very much.